This is an LED street light, and it is bright, controversial, and it may be the most revolutionary technology of the past 20 years. Street lights. Most of us don't think twice about them. They're just there, flicking on at dusk and off at dawn, like clockwork. But when your city suddenly swaps them all out overnight, you might start to notice. Some are orange, some are blue, some make everything look like a dreamy painting. And others like you're starring in a found footage horror movie. So today we're going to do something a little unusual. We're going to talk about street lights. Yes, street lights. Because the story of how we got from fire-based lanterns to hyper-efficient smart LED fixtures is actually a fascinating one. And spoiler, the Humba LED may be one of the most important infrastructure upgrades of the past two decades. But like most changes, it hasn't been without controversy. You've probably heard someone complain about the blinding new lights in their neighborhood, or maybe you've said it yourself. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we light the world after dark and why LEDs are both the hero we deserve and maybe the one we weren't quite ready for. To understand where we are now, we have to go back, like way back, back to when street lighting meant Literal fire. Open flames in glass boxes, gas lanterns that were manually lit each night, often by lamplighters walking routes throughout the city. It was charming and also dim, unreliable, and oh yeah, dangerously flammable. The electric revolution changed everything. In the late 1800s, we got arc lamps, massively bright, loud, and prone to sparking. They were usually installed high above city streets and lit entire blocks with a blue-white glow. They were a bit much, honestly. Then came the incandescent bulb, invented in the late 1800s, commercialized in the early 1900s, and still in use today in some very determined households. Those gave us warmer, softer lighting, but were inefficient and didn't last very long. Still, they were easier to maintain than arc lamps and looked nicer than gas. By the mid-20th century, we upgraded to high-intensity discharge lamps, first mercury vapor, then high-pressure sodium, or HPS, now, if you've ever been bathed in the orange haze of an older streetlight, you've experienced HPS. It's like living in a movie where every scene takes place at sunset, except it's 2 a.m. and you're just trying to find your car. HPS lights were popular for good reasons. They were cheap to operate, had long lifespans, and put out a lot of lumens per watt. But their color rendering? Let's be kind and say not ideal. And if you needed to tell whether a car was green or red under an HPS lamp, well, good luck. These things had a color rendering index, which we'll talk more about later, of around 20 out of 100. That's a failing grade. So by the early 2000s, we had a problem. Energy costs were rising, cities were strapped for maintenance budgets, and the light quality on our streets wasn't great. We needed something better. Enter LEDs. The LED, or light-emitting diode, wasn't new in the early 2000s, but it was finally becoming viable, and cities around the world started to take notice. Why? Well, for starters, LEDs are more efficient than traditional light sources. A typical high-pressure sodium lamp might get you around 100 lumens per watt. LEDs, easily 130, sometimes 150 or more. That's more light for less power, and cities pay a lot for power. Plus, LEDs don't have fragile filaments or gas tubes. They don't need to warm up. They don't buzz. They don't hum. They don't care if it's minus 20 outside. They just turn on instantly. It's light on demand. Municipalities also saw a big advantage in lifespan. While an HPS bulb might last 24,000 hours, an LED fixture can last up to 100,000 hours or more. That's fewer bucket trucks rolling out to change bulbs, fewer man hours, and much lower maintenance costs. The pitch was simple, lower energy bills, longer lifespans, and smarter infrastructure. And so the LED revolution began. From New York to New Delhi, cities started yanking out their old lights and putting in shiny new LEDs. But, of course, there was a catch. And if your city was part of the first wave of conversions, you probably already know what it is. Those early LEDs, they were bright, they were blue, and they were not exactly what you'd call cozy. We'll get into why that happened and how the industry responded, but first let's talk about how an LED actually works because it really is fascinating. As I said a little bit earlier, LED stands for light emitting diode. It's a solid state device meaning no moving parts, no filaments, no gas. Instead it uses a semiconductor material, usually a combination of gallium, arsenic, phosphorus, and other exotic sounding elements. Here's what happens. When current flows through the semiconductor, electrons move across what's called a PN junction. On one side you've got extra electrons, on the other you've got holes, or spots where an electron could go. 
When those electrons fall into those holes, they release energy in the form of photons. And what's a photon? It's light. And unlike incandescent bulbs, which scatter light in all directions, LEDs emit light in a specific direction. That means you can focus it, shape it, aim it exactly where it's needed, which if you're lighting a road and not a bird's nest three stories up, that's pretty useful. LEDs also generate less heat. Not zero heat, mind you. They still need heat sinks and proper thermal management, but way less than older lighting. That's part of why they last so long. Less heat equals less stress on the components. Now, you might have noticed something else about LED light. It often comes from a tiny yellow square, but the light it produces can be white or even colored. That's because most white LEDs are actually blue LEDs coated in a yellow phosphor. The mix of blue and yellow creates the appearance of white light. That's pretty clever. So the sword explanation is semiconductors plus clever chemistry equals long lasting energy efficient lighting. It's science and maybe also a little bit of magic. So next let's talk about color temperature because this is one of the main reasons people either love or absolutely despise LED street lighting. Because sometimes it really does feel like your neighborhood just got turned into the inside of a hospital waiting room. Color temperature is measured in Kelvins, not degrees, just Kelvins. It describes the hue of the light a source gives off. 2700K to 3000K, warm, cozy, yellowish light. 4000K is a neutral white. 5000K and above is a cool white to bluish daylight. High pressure sodium lights, for all of their faults, had a very warm color temperature, around 2100K. That's why everything under them looked orange. LEDs, on the other hand, can be made at virtually any color temperature. But in the early days, the industry leaned hard into 5000K or even 6000K for street lights. So why did they do that? It's simple, efficiency. These cooler color LEDs tend to be a bit more efficient than their warmer counterparts, but efficiency came at a cost. The light felt harsh, cold, and clinical, and that caused a lot of backlash. People complained about glare, feeling like they were under a dentist's lamp while walking their dog. There were even some claims some more valid than others, that these lights interfered with sleep, disrupted wildlife, or caused headaches. To be fair, some of those concerns are valid, especially when municipalities went too far with brightness or didn't aim the fixtures properly, but the industry has learned. These days, most cities opt for LEDs in the 2700K to 3000K range. They still save energy, but offer a much warmer, more neutral light. Now, while we're on the topic of visual quality, let's talk about another important color metric, CRI or the Color Rendering Index. CRI measures how accurately a light source reveals the true colors of objects compared to a natural reference light. It's scored from zero to 100. Incandescent bulbs have a perfect CRI of 100. HPS street lights, around 20, maybe 25 on a good day. LEDs are often 70 to 90 or more. That means under LED lights, you can actually tell red from orange, blue from green. In short, LEDs just don't light the world. They reveal it more accurately, and that's a pretty big deal. Now, let's talk about optics, because here's where LEDs really pull ahead, not just in how they make light, but in how precisely they put it where it needs to go. See, older bulbs like high-pressure sodium or mercury vapor emit light in every direction which is great if you're trying to light up a disco ball, but not so great when you're trying to focus light downward onto a street. That's why older fixtures needed big, clunky reflectors and glass lenses to redirect light, and even then, a lot of it still got wasted. LEDs don't have that problem. They naturally emit light in a specific direction. That makes it easy to design fixtures that focus the beam exactly where it's needed and nowhere else. This brings us to light distribution types. LED street lights are engineered to have highly specific light patterns. Label this type one through type five. For example, type one is for narrow walkways or sidewalks. Type two and three are commonly for standard two lane and residential streets. Type four is for wider roadways or perimeters. And type five provides a circular omnidirectional spread, perfect for big open areas like parking lots. All of this is possible thanks to carefully engineered optics, lenses, reflectors, and light guide plates that channel and shape the beam. Companies like Cree, Signify, Eaton and Cooper Lighting, and even GE design optical systems that can distribute light with surprising precision. You'll also hear the term full cutoff or zero up light a lot. And what that means is the fixture is designed to avoid shining any light above the horizontal plane. And why does that matter? Because light shining up into the sky contributes to light pollution, wastes energy, and drowns out the stars. But it's not only just about the stars. Poorly directed light can shine straight into your bedroom window, causing glare and ruining your sleep. So full cutoff designs are about focusing light down where it's useful and keeping it out of places that it's not. 
It's all very deliberate. Modern LED fixtures are less like bulbs in a box and more like optical instruments. Every angle, every lens, every diode has a job. And that job is to give you just enough light to feel safe without making you feel like you're walking through an airport tarmac at midnight. Okay, so we've covered the light part of LED street lighting. Now we're gonna talk about the smart part because some of these new lights, they're doing more than just lighting up the street. Smart LED systems are kind of like your phone, but way less fun and way more practical. They're connected to central control systems that allow cities to dim lights during low traffic hours, schedule lighting changes automatically, and detect outages in real time. And they can even adjust brightness based on weather or pedestrian activity. Now, here's where it gets really futuristic. Some smart LED systems come with built-in environmental sensors that can monitor air quality, humidity, noise levels, and even seismic activity. Others are equipped with motion sensors or cameras that allow for dynamic lighting. That means lights stay dim most of the time, but brighten when someone walks by kind of like a security light, but for public roads. And yes, some of them can even provide Wi-Spy hot, why spy? Why spy? And yes, some of them can even provide Wi-Fi hotspots or service charging stations for electric scooters. This isn't just lighting anymore, it's infrastructure. It's part of the so-called internet of things where your streetlight becomes part of a connected ecosystem. And while that sounds a little dystopian depending on your trust level, it also opens the door to better services and big energy savings. Smart systems also make maintenance way more efficient. Instead of waiting for someone to call in a broken streetlight or worse, not report it at all, the system can can send an alert when a fixture fails. Some can even detect when the light output drops below a certain threshold, which might indicate aging components. So yes, your street light might not just be watching you, it might quietly be judging its own performance too. All right, but now we gotta talk about the most important part of this all, cost. Because while it's fun to talk about optics and sensors and color rendering, I know that's everyone's favorite topic. At the end of the day, cities want to know one thing, is this going to save money? Let's start with the initial cost. A new LED streetlight fixture typically runs anywhere from $300 to $800, depending on wattage features and smart capabilities. That doesn't include labor, permitting, or disposal of the old fixtures. So yeah, if you multiply that by a few thousand lights, you're talking big money. But here's the trade-off, electricity savings. LEDs can use up to 70% less energy than traditional high-pressure sodium or metal halide lights. That adds up fast. So let's say a city has 10,000 streetlights. Swapping them to LEDs could save hundreds of thousands of dollars per year on electricity alone. And that's not just a theory. Plenty of cities are already seeing it. According to a report from the US Department of Energy, many municipalities recover their upfront investment in just four to six years. And remember, it's not just about the energy savings. LED fixtures last much longer, often 10 to 20 years compared to five or six for HPS bulbs. That's fewer replacements, fewer trips by city maintenance crews, and overall lower labor costs. There's also a hidden cost in older systems, downtime. When a light goes out, it creates a safety hazard. It erodes public confidence and it might not be noticed or reported for weeks or even at all. With smart LED networks, cities can know the moment a light fails and sometimes even fix it remotely. So yeah, the upfront cost is high, but the long-term savings are even higher, which is why as of 2025, over half of US municipalities have already made the switch or are actively planning to. So we've heard a lot about why LED streetlights are great, but now let's flip the switch because not everyone is so excited about the glow up. As soon as cities started installing LEDs, the complaints rolled in. They're too bright. They look awful. I can't sleep. These things are giving me migraines. Some folks even claimed the lights were spying on them, which they weren't. Probably. Now let's unpack this a little bit. First, yes, early LED deployments had problems. Many cities installed 5,000 or 6,000 K fixtures, those cool bluish white ones. They were efficient, but they also had a harsh sterile quality. Combine that with high mounting heights and poorly aimed fixtures and you get Glare City. In some neighborhoods, the brightness wasn't just uncomfortable, it was overwhelming. Light trespass into homes disrupted sleep and made it feel like permanent daylight and in some cases triggered genuine health issues. The American Medical Association even got involved. In 2016, they issued a warning about high intensity LED lighting. They were primarily concerned about blue rich light disrupting circadian rhythms and potentially increasing the risk of chronic health issues, but this still stirred up a lot of fear. Some people thought that all LEDs were dangerous, but what the AMA was really saying was cities should avoid using super high Kelvin lights and should aim fixtures properly. And honestly, 
That's solid advice. Lighting manufacturers and municipalities have listened. These days, most new installations use 2700 to 3000K fixtures with better optics, lower glare, and more shielding. Some cities even retrofitted their early installs to tone things down a little bit. But some of the backlash still persists, often fueled by a mix of aesthetic preference, nostalgia, and a natural resistance to change. High pressure sodium lights for all of their flaws did have a kind of cozy glow that people got used to. LEDs with their stark clarity just felt different. So while LEDs are objectively better in many ways, they weren't always rolled out thoughtfully and that gave them a reputation they're still trying to shake today. Now this next part is something more specific to where I live in Wisconsin, but it's still interesting nonetheless. When I head south in Illinois, especially around the Chicago area, I still see a lot of those old high pressure sodium street lights casting their familiar orange glow. But back home in Wisconsin, it's a different story. LEDs have taken over, so what's really going on here? Now where I live in Wisconsin, the city maintains over 2,400 streetlights with another 2,100 owned by the utility company. And while the exact conversion date isn't publicly documented, you can see it for yourself. LEDs are everywhere in my city. Meanwhile, in Illinois, it's a little bit more complicated. Utilities like Armian, Ar Am Amarin? Sorry to everyone that lives in Illinois. Amarin. Amarin. Okay. Meanwhile, in Illinois, it's a little bit more complicated. Utilities like Ameren only started large-scale replacements in 2017, and while cities like Elgin and Peoria are rolling out LEDs, there's no unified state push. It's happening city by city, utility by utility. Why the difference, though? Well, Wisconsin has pushed for greener infrastructure with more state-level support. Illinois, though, more fragmentation, more red tape, typical Illinois things, bigger population centers with more logistics. So it's not so it's not that Illinois doesn't want LEDs, it's just that the road to get there is a little bit slower because it's Illinois. What is your problem, man? Do you know how to fucking drive? No. What? So if you've ever wondered why you cross the state line from Wisconsin to Illinois and it seems like you time travel back into the 90s, now you know. All right, I promise we're almost done. Let's just recap a little bit. LED street lights are more efficient, last longer, and offer better lighting quality than almost anything that came before. They've got smarter controls, lower maintenance needs, and yes, they help cities save money, and that's important. But they're not perfect. The early rollout mistakes gave them a bad reputation in some places. Poor aiming, bad color choices, and a lack of public input didn't help either. But the technology itself... It's solid, and it's only getting better. So whether you love the clarity or miss the old sodium glow, LED streetlights are here to stay. And with the right planning, they can make our streets safer, our skies darker, and our cities smarter. So next time you're out at night, look up. That little fixture above you might just be one of the most quietly transformative technologies of the past 20 years. Thanks for watching. If you found this video illuminating, give it a like, subscribe for more tech deep dives, and let me know in the comments, what kind of streetlight does your neighborhood still use? Until next time, stay bright, but not 6,000K bright. Let's keep it tasteful. Thanks for watching. If you found this video inform- oh, illuminating, sorry. <laughs> when I head south into Illinois, I, it, I just said Illinois, wow. <laughs> They were primarily concerned about blue rich. Oh my God. But what the AMA was really saying was shit. Oh my God. Avoid using super high Kelvin light. Oh my God. This is an LED street light and it is bright. They're controversial. Oh shit, I fucked it up. This is an LED street light and it's bright, controversial, but it also may be shit.